I would hope that I might have been able to achieve what I've achieved without having to have suffered the way I did. But I, don't, I can't answer that. I can say that what I do as an artist, as an actor, and as a director, and whatever else, I draw upon personal experience and that personal pain in order to create other characters. All my memories of those early years are just all about drunks. Everyone seemed to be drunk, everyone seemed to be fighting. I'm sure Mum wasn't drunk all the time, but um, I can sort of just remember odd things like standing on the table and smearing my legs with the sulphur and treacle to get rid of the scabies, but mainly drunk. What about your father? He was a, a busker, a street musician. In fact, he was a very good singer and had a very fine musical training, but unfortunately cocaine and alcohol wrecked his career by the time I was born. And uh, my sister and I would, on special occasions, wear little uh, clown outfits and we'd collect the pennies. So I, I've always had um, memories of performing of some sort. What was it like at home? On cold, wet Melbourne nights, my sister and I would sit at the broken window and count the yellow cabs in the street to stave off our hunger. And she used to do all sorts of things to distract me from the noise of the drugs, because there was always fights or something. She used to sit me on her knee and pick the fleas out of my hair and crack them between her thumbnails. Why were you always hungry? Because we were never fed. Was there any adult in your life who did look after you, did feed you? Uh, Uncle Josh, he, uh, he wasn't really, uh, well, I don't know whether he was a real uncle or not, but he first sexually abused me when I was four. He, uh, whenever, um, I was hungry, which I always was, and uh, whenever, uh, yes, I used to go next door to Uncle Josh's house, and he used to put his penis in my mouth. So. And he used also to feed you, so that you knew that if you did go in there, you'd get fed and you'd be hungry enough to do it, but there was a price to pay for it. Well, I didn't think of it in those sort of terms. I thought that that's, that, that all grown-ups did that sort of thing. That, um, that's how they showed, showed you that they cared about you. So how did you survive? Well, I wouldn't have survived, really, without my sister, who was older than me. So my, uh, according to my pa papers, my mother abandoned us, and uh, then we came downstairs one morning and my father and everybody else had disappeared. So then Mag um, looked after me. Uh, she went out into the streets of Carlton and stole food from the shops. And we must have stunk. Uh, you know, we were covered in lice and scabies. And then one day the nuns um, locked us in a shed in the backyard. They'd, they'd called the welfare department. And that evening we were taken to the uh, Royal Park Welfare Depot. And one morning uh, I woke up and I found the little boy who was supposed to be in the next bed to me, hanging by his neck. He was 11. <laughs> you know, they're difficult to shrug off. Memories. I can live with them. Did you see anything of your sister? She used to find ways of sneaking out at night and come into the boys' dorm to make sure I was all right. Then I didn't see her again until we were adopted. Well, we weren't really adopted. We were fostered out. We went to live in a small town in the northwest of New South Wales called Barron Junction. This man named Arthur Challenger, um, we were given to him. Now, during that period, he would sometimes bring you down to Sydney 
Why was that? Well, he was a train driver, and he, uh, which meant all the sheep were loaded onto a train in Burren. They were nightmare journeys. Once the train, there was a little compartment at the back of the train. Once the train pulled out of Burren Junction Station, he would start fondling me and take all my clothes off and indulge in his favourite pastime. His elderly mother lived with him. How did she treat you? Uh, she was lovely. She was, she was uh, the other side of the coin. And she was the one who picked up that you had a serious problem with your knee? Yep. And so how did you get on when you were sent down to the Far West Children's Home at Manly for treatment? It was great, you know, it was masses of food and... The word Aboriginal was never used, and we were referred to as bright young things with dark complexions. Every Saturday, a different amateur group would come and perform for us. So, when you think about it, young, healthy, robust girls tap dancing for a whole lot of cripples. <laughs> it was um, it was quite a thing. So, I think they were my first role models in a way. You were never sent back to Barren Junction. Why was that? Um, apparently, my sister told a little girl at school what was happening to her at home. The little girl's father was the only policeman in Barron Junction. He went down to the house to report this rumour that was now going around. And he saw Arthur Challenger sexually abusing my sister. When he was sent to prison, you and your sister went back to Melbourne to live with your mother. How did you adjust to that? I didn't. I went to school up the hill at St Michael's and uh, I was beaten up a lot by the other boys and called a dirty little black bastard and all of those things. So I left school and I became what is known today, laughingly, or not so laughingly, as a street kid. What do you mean by that? Well, I became a rent boy. I became a thief petty criminal, all of those things. Did you ever go home to your mother? Only when she was sober. At the back of our house it was like a cul-de-sac, a lane, but there was nowhere to go to. And so all the local drunks used to get there and drink metho and terrible rot gut port. And when mama was sober she'd make huge pots of stew and take it down the lane to them. So she was very caring. Did you know that she was part Aboriginal? What did you know about your heritage? Uh, but we always assumed we were. You see, we didn't know that our father was African. He was black. So we were treated and vilified as Aboriginals. Long before I discovered that my great-grandmother was known Jerry. So I grew up assuming, or not assuming, but believing that I was Aboriginal anyway. Now, when you were about 15, you got yourself a real job in a bookstore. Did this change the way you'd been living? That was the beginning of my bohemian days. There was a wonderful girl there, and Cheska took me one night to see an amateur performance of Les Sophies at the National Theatre. And she said to me, she nudged me, and she said, you could do that. And I knew I could, and took myself off to ballet lessons, bare feet. Now, when you became part of the Melbourne theatre scene and you were dancing and acting on the stage, how did that change who you mixed with socially? I was pretty exotic to look at when I was very young. And so, you know, the best dresses in Melbourne were open to me, to parties and things. And this particular night I was invited to a party at Max Jabari's house. Max was a very famous female impersonator. Now, the difference between female, uh, sorry, female impersonators and drag queens of today, it was a vast difference. When the police arrived at two in the morning, well, people scurried out of the back window and I was the youngest person in the room. And I put my age up, I said I was 18. I was taken down to the local police station and uh, after a few words with the detective, he realized that uh, roughing me up wasn't going to get him anywhere. So then he played the big brother role. And he said, then if I signed a confession saying that I had sex with Max, I could go home. In a flight of fancy, you know, I concocted this wonderful story and, you know, it was all fabrication. 
and signed it. And I wasn't allowed to go home. I was locked up for the night. We were both found guilty. And uh, I was sent off to Pentridge to wait for sentencing. What happened in Pentridge? Well, it was frightening in itself. I was sexually abused or raped by one of the prison guards because of my offence. And I decided then that I wanted to kill myself. And I just felt worthless and, you know, it just all caved in. And when I was sitting there, I heard the voices. And when I woke up in the morning, I knew they were the voices of my ancestors that I'd heard. And they were telling me that if I hold on, that um, there was a better life for me, and I'd find it. In the event, you were placed on a bond and released, but the stigma of that trial stuck, and you changed your name. That was when I found out I was illegitimate, and I got a copy of my birth certificate, and there was no Christian Tovey. Everyone knew me as no Christian Morton, you see. I just assumed, always assumed my name was Morton because that was my father's name. And so, as Noel Tovey, what did you do? I um, joined the National Theatre. I was a dancer at the Tivoli. It was, uh, conversely speaking, I spent all my formative years at the Princess Theatre. So I did bells are ringing, uh, salad days. I, I did about five or six musicals there. And uh, I did um, a lot of children's television from 19... 56 onwards. I'd reinvented myself one of the numerous times and I'd given myself this alter ego which he was a white Anglo-Saxon blue-eyed matinee idol and his name was Rowan Scott Rowan and he he was the in fact friends of mine who know me very well say that he's never left me but oh that's very kind of you, Godfrey. Oh, not at all. But are you sure you won't come to the ball this evening, Mrs. Cole? No, thanks. I'll be quite happy to get an early night. Oh, right, eh? Uh, don't be long, darling. I'll just help Mummy unpack. I'll wait in Dad's room. When I was much younger and first working in England, because I grew up believing I was Aboriginal, I invented stories. I'd say, no, my father was part Negro, part Spanish. I never mentioned the word Aboriginal. Why? Well, because from the moment I can remember hearing anyone actual talk, it was always about black, abos. Get those abo bastards out of here. Ah, oh, you're nothing but a dirty abo. I grew up with that. What gave you the idea that you really wanted to go to England? I knew that I had to go somewhere where no one knew me that I wouldn't be judged on my infamous past and that I wouldn't be judged on my black inheritance, that I'd be only judged on what I could do. Before you left, you got married. Why did you get married? We were both really running away from our dysfunctional families. We uh, both cared about each other, certainly enough to have a baby. How did you take to fatherhood? Oh, I loved it. That could have been the making of me. Uh, and that was rather sad that leaving her behind when we separated. And people ask me if I have any regrets. I just, uh, that's one of the few, very few regrets I have, that we didn't have the relationship that I always hoped we would have. Now, in London, you worked a lot on the stage, and then you had this big break when you were asked to choreograph The Boyfriend. That was a major West End show. And I noticed that you danced in it as well. I danced the tango, because I'd always wanted to. So I, did, I choreographed it and danced it myself. So from then on, you know, I was known as a choreographer. After that, I then, you know, started directing as well. I also got a reputation at that time for being difficult to work with. How did you get that? Because I. It was very demanding. I, I expected everyone to give absolutely 100% all the time, the best. How did you get involved in O Calcutta? My agent rang me and said, Clifford Williams is directing O Calcutta and uh, 
wanted to know if you could help him with the auditions. And then, first of all, Clifford asked me if I'd like to be in it. And I said, no, I was really trying to be a, a director. And Ken Tynan was there and said, I'll, written sketch, I'll write the sketch for you. So I couldn't resist. I, mean, I rang my agent and said that I had this offer to be in it. And I said how wonderful it would be to stand naked on the West End stage and say, fuck, with no one had ever done. From there, Clifford asked me if I would stage it with him in Paris and then again in Hamburg. And then I was asked to come to Australia and direct and choreograph it. This was 1971. How was it received in Australia? We invited, or the management invited, several members of the police force. And we were doing the show for them, basically for their OK. And uh, I was up at the back of the dress circle, and I heard two of these people, official people, I think they were policemen, one say to the other, what a pity, uh, we're going to stop it, but we might as well see it. So with that, I walked onto the stage and called it to a halt, called the stage manager on and said, dismantle it. And then I returned to London. You'd begun a relationship in London that was of immense importance to you. How did you meet? Well, I was in a Calcutta, and this boy um, waited for me at the stage door and asked for my autograph, and then I got a sort of series of fan stroke love letters from Dave and that started, that was the beginning of 17 years together. Given the way in which you were brought up with all the uncertainties, how important was commitment for you? Commitment was very important. I was incredibly jealous person. In fact, the only person I felt secure with was Dave actually. That's why my work flourished. My best work in the theatre was done in the years that we were together, having that anchor. And where did the idea for the gallery you opened with Dave come from? Well, it started during The Boyfriend, my love of period in the 20s. So it's, wherever I was in the world, I would go into junk shops and collect these wonderful, um, now quite <laughs> expensive, uh, bronze and ivory um, statuettes from the 20s and glass, and ceramics. Everyone in London, or indeed in London and America and Europe, were really into what is now called Art Deco. Did you find that working together was a good thing or a strain on the relationship? Oh, uh, you know, it, it was a good thing and a bad thing because it, it was a strain on the relationship. Um, mainly because you can't live and work with somebody 24 hours a day. And then when he became ill, no one knew what HIV or AIDS was. It was terrible because I, even our best friends wouldn't come into the flat. His mother wouldn't drink, come in and have a cup of tea. Um, and then I took him back to the hospital just after Christmas and um, I sat in that hospital room for four days and I kept saying, you know, you can go Dave, I'm here, you can die, you can go. So then he, he didn't die and I went to this doctor again and I said, if you don't kill him now, I'm going to put this pillow over his face and I had the pillow. And he said, you know what you're asking me to do? I said, yes. He said, explain that I couldn't tell anybody that because of the legal ramifications, and I held Dave while the doctor injected him in the heart. After Dave died, how did you get along? Badly. Um, I came back and I, I was sitting on the beach at Bronte. It was seven in the morning. Absolute flat calm. From out of nowhere, this wind came up off the sea. The sea was like a mirror, and whirly whirly, Aboriginal we call whirly whirly wind came up, and the sand kicked up in my face, and I heard the voices of my ancestors saying, "It's time." I left the beach. I called my agent and my lawyer, and said, "I'm coming home to Australia." Uh, friends thought I was a bit rash and couldn't understand it, but I closed the gallery. 
And I was out for dinner with my good friend Rabina and her husband Clive. And there were these、um, salesmen making really bad taste Aboriginal jokes. And I was wincing a bit. Clive could see that I was wincing. And he turned around in a broad Australian accent, said to these guys, Shut up, my mate's an Abbo. And I thought that night, Yes, I am. And from that night on, I went public. And the best way for me to do it was to say, Yes, I'm Aboriginal. And try and put all the knowledge that I, and experience that I'd gained overseas in 35 years back into the community here. And you helped set up a drama course at an Aboriginal college. How did that work out for you? There w a s ongoing problems there. And you know, the other teachers just said, Why are you complaining? You had 10 people at class this morning. I said, There should have been 18. And they said, But we only get three. And I went and I said, Look, we should do something about this. And the principal said, No. If we declare the numbers that are coming, our funding will drop, and you know, all that sort of thing. Then one day, three girls came back to class stoned after lunch, and I asked them to leave. And then the headmaster said, that, or the principal said, that he didn't want to get rid of the girls. And、uh, I said, Look, drugs have never been part of my agenda. And either they go or I go. And.、Uh, I went. I think one has to be very understanding and tolerant, but not make excuses. I firmly believe that if we want to move ahead as people, then Aboriginals have to be able to stand up and be judged and criticised, the same as every other Australian. For instance, I had a letter from one of the Aboriginal officers at one of our leading drama institutions, wrote to me and said, Dear Noel,、um, We'd like your support. We don't think that Indigenous students should have to study Shakespeare. I wrote back and said, Do you want to marginalise us even further?、Yeah. So I have very strong views. One time I sat on seven committees, both federal and state, representing Indigenous arts, protocol, social injustice. How effective do you think it's been? One can sit up in committees. Here in Sydney or in Melbourne and pontificate about what we'd like to do for our black brothers. But I, I have to say, in the 10 years or 12 years that I was involved, I saw very little, and I hate the word outcome. I hate the word outcome because every committee has a whiteboard and outcomes. But you know, fundament- at, at the grassroots level, Very little has been done. But also, I have to say, and I could come in for being criticised, my own people have done very little to help themselves. You can't go on blaming people forever. What about you, Noel? Have you ever blamed people? Perhaps your mother? It took a long while for me to understand that what happened to us wasn't mama's fault. As I got older, And as she got older, I understood and I, I no longer blamed her for everything that had happened to us as children. The day I stopped blaming was the day we really became friends. And also, I stopped blaming everyone the night I heard my ancestors speak to me in jail. You know, I knew from that moment on that my life was in my own hands and it was up to me to make what I could of it. What happened to Rowan Scott Rowan? Rowan Scott Rowan was who was living in London. I was Rowan Scott Rowan. Is, is he still with you? Fondly, yes. Because he helped me survive. You've suffered in your life a range of stigmas. You've had the stigma of being poor, being black, being gay. Which is the worst stigma for? In your experience, that society imposes on people from those categories? You know, this may be the first time I've ever answered this question truthfully. I could handle everything except being gay when I was younger. Because that was almost worse than being Aboriginal. But I've learned that there's only a stigma if you let it become one. That if you say, I'm proud of being black, I'm proud of being gay, and I'm proud of who I am, then there's no stigma. It's other people's problems.
They create them.